Tonight, it's Trump. Two for two for the former president as he rakes in the granite state. You know, we won New Hampshire three times now, three. Donald Trump now sits at pole position in the primary race for the Republican presidential nomination, perhaps sealing the deal. Not done yet. A defiant Nikki Haley says that she will fight on and will not stop. This race is far from over. However, analysts say that if she continues to fail in the next two primaries and fails in her home state of South Carolina, her credibility will suffer. Finally, a truce. A peace proposal for Gaza takes shape as top Biden advisor pushes for a truce that's acceptable by both parties. However, an earlier plan, which has been rejected by Israel, envisions a pathway for the creation of a Palestinian state. And the Oppenheimer's Oscars. Hollywood has discovered the nominations for this year's Oscars and Barbie ain't happy. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Alaverna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. A very good evening everyone. Thank you very much for making us part of your evenings. We have the full coverage of the New Hampshire primary where Donald Trump swept the polls and also all about the Oscars. Uh, well, that's uh, coming up shortly, but, f but first we have some breaking news. A Russian military plane with 74 people on board has crashed in the region of Belgorod in Russia near the Ukrainian border. Russia state media reported, uh, quoting the uh, region's governor, that all those on board were killed. The cause of the crash is not yet clear and there are conflicting accounts about who or what was on board. Russian me uh, media reported that uh, 65 Ukrainian servicemen were on the plane being flown to Belgorod ahead of a prisoner swap. But Ukraine's military said that the plane was carrying air defense missiles. Now, Belgorod has uh, come under frequent attacks from Ukraine in recent weeks. At the end of uh, December last year's uh, strikes, at least uh, killed 25 people in one of the deadliest single incidents for Russian civil civilians in the war. In other stories we have for you tonight, National Security Council Strategic Communications Coordinator in the U.S., John Kirby, declines to confirm the parameters of a possible humanitarian pause and hostage deal in Gaza put forth by the Israelis, but he says that the discussions are sober and serious. Now, this comes after another peace proposal put forward by, by the Arab nations were rejected flat out by Israel, who said that any conversation that entails a path towards statehood for Palestine will not be accepted. Israel and Hamas have moved closer to agreeing on a 30-day ceasefire in Gaza and the release of Israeli hostages and Palestinian prisoners. That's according to sources, coming as Israel pressed ahead with its biggest assault in a month in southern Gaza. Qatar, the US and Egypt have been mediating between the two sides for weeks over the release of Israeli captives in return for a break in fighting, the release of Palestinian prisoners and more aid to the enclave. But the plan is being held up, the sources said, with Hamas and Israel at odds over how to permanently end the Gaza war. U.S., Qatari and Egyptian authorities did not immediately respond to requests for comment on the report. Though on Tuesday, the White House did confirm that Middle East envoy Brett McGurk was in Cairo for active talks over hostage release and aid while declining to comment on reports of any ceasefire deal. Certainly one of the things he's in the region talking about is the potential for another hostage deal, which would require a humanitarian pause of some length uh, to, to get that done. Two Egyptian security sources said there was work underway to convince Hamas to accept a one-month truce to be followed by a permanent ceasefire. However, Hamas is requesting guarantees that the permanent ceasefire would be carried out to agree to the initial truce. An Israeli government spokesperson said Tuesday the country's goals of destroying Hamas's governing and military capabilities remain the same. There will be no ceasefire that leaves the hostages in Gaza and Hamas in power. Beyond that, we have nothing to elaborate. 
Still, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is under increasing pressure to reach a ceasefire deal from his war cabinet and families of hostages. Despite the difficulty of bridging the gap in the positions of the two sides, a source briefed on the discussions told a deal could be agreed to at any minute. Well, what's the latest on the New Hampshire primary and does it mean that Donald Trump will be the nominee of the Republican Party? All that coming right after this break. You're watching World News Tonight. Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Now, the former President of the United States is all smiles today after New Hampshire Republican voters delivered a commanding victory that would have sealed the nomination deal for Trump. Despite it uh, having only been two primaries, the Republican voters seem to have made up their mind to give another chance for the former President to take back the White House. Donald Trump won New Hampshire's Republican presidential primary election on Tuesday. That was according to Edison Research projections as polls began to close. The victory further cements Trump's dominance over the party as he heads towards a likely November rematch with Democratic President Joe Biden. You know, we won New Hampshire three times now, three. three. We win it every time. We win the primary, we win the generals, we've won it, and it's a very, very special place to me. It's very important. And just a little note to Nikki. She's not going to win. She's not going to win. Trump's only remaining rival in the race, former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, told her supporters Tuesday night she would remain in the race. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. With around three quarters of the expected vote counted, Edison showed Trump had close to 54 percent, compared with 44 percent for Haley. New Hampshire's primary is semi-open meaning people not registered with any party could still participate in the GOP vote. Haley had hoped the Northeastern state's sizable block of independent voters would carry her to an upset win that might loosen Trump's grip on the Republican Party. Trump will instead become the first Republican to sweep competitive votes in both Iowa and New Hampshire since 1976. The results will likely increase calls from some Republicans for Haley to drop out of the race though her campaign vowed in a memo on Tuesday to push forward until Super Tuesday, when Republicans in 15 states vote on the same day in early March. The next Republican primary contest is scheduled for February 24th in South Carolina, where Haley was born and served two terms as governor. But despite those ties, Trump has racked up endorsements from most of the state's prominent Republicans, and opinion polls show him with a wide lead. A form inside a hotel ballroom with supporters whistling, screaming and bouncing campaign signs around her, Nikki Haley wasn't about to let this be her last stand. She had come too far to let it all go in one night, even as the pundits, uh, the media, and now another state's voters were nudging her towards the exit just hours uh, earlier. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. Political analysts said Haley faces a steep climb in upcoming primary races, even in her own home state of South Carolina, where she served as governor, but where Trump has a fervent base of support. Haley had hoped the northeastern state's sizable number of independent voters would carry her to an upset win that might loosen Trump's iron grip on the Republican Party. Exit polls showed her 11th-hour sprint may have paid off. Two-thirds of voters who made their decision in the last few days voted for her. The loss may not deter Haley in the short term, but the reality is that New Hampshire was her best shot to disrupt Trump's steady march towards a Republican presidential nomination. She spent tens of millions of dollars here and had the endorsement of the state's popular Republican governor. But New Hampshire's independent voters and large proportion of college graduates were not enough to deliver victory. Haley is now looking ahead to the primary in her home state of South Carolina next month. To get there, however, she will need the campaign contributions to keep flowing. 
Well, with Nikki Haley's refusal to step out of the race and Trump's formidable push to gain the nomination, it seems like the Republican Party needs to come together as soon as possible in order to be in a commanding position in the general election coming in November. Let's get some insights on this and for that, uh, watching all the events on a very cold morning from all the way in Toronto, Canada, is Abhijit Gera, my world news special correspondent, Susan Shanali, who joins me now. So, Shanali, um, good to see you. Thank you very much for our being here. Now, what are you learning about what the Republican Party is uh, really looking into right now? Yes, Mahish, uh, former President Donald Trump took a huge step towards winning a third consecutive Republican presidential nomination today. And Trump is clearly looking like the final candidate now, and there should be no need to go through these primaries. Vivek Ramaswamy is also backing Trump by saying Haley should give up and not waste resources. But Haley does not look like she's going to back down anytime soon, and Haley vowed to remain in the Republican race. However, though Trump's win was a huge step towards uh, cementing the GOP nomination, there were warning signs for his general election hopes within exit polls of New Hampshire Republican primary voters. And uh, after Tuesday night's results, that 2020 presidential rematch seems much more likely. And even if uh, that is a prospect poll suggests that many Americans do not welcome it. Indeed, uh, Shanali, in a situation where it's going to be uh, an, a race between Trump versus Biden in November, is America really ready for another uh, match against these two uh, presidents? Well, the truth is, Mahesh, that Americans aren't too thrilled about the possibility of a rematch between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. And yes, as you said, Mahesh, the voters of New Hampshire have thrust the United States one giant step closer to a general election rematch between the two unpopular candidates. U.S. presidential elections have been rocked in recent years by economic disasters, stunning gaps, secret videos, and of course, the pandemic and economic disasters. But for all the tumult that defined those campaigns, the volatility surrounding this year's presidential contest has few modern parallels, posing profound challenges to the future of American democracy. And uh, there are just certain issues that the Americans want resolved, which are implications of abortion, democracy, economic disasters and inflation. And um, when talking about the economy, voters largely don't seem to credit Biden with his uh, stewardship and say that they, he remains anxious about, they remain anxious about, you know, high prices. And of course, the final problem of foreign policies. Um, a Trump victory could raise the possibility of the US largely abandoning Ukraine as it seems to repel Russia's invasion. Domestic policy uh, policies could also test Biden's commitment to Israel, a policy that threatens to erode his standing with young voters and people of color who are critical elements for this coalition. So Mahish, America isn't ready. Biden and Trump are posed for a potential rematch that could shake American politics. Over to you, Mahesh. Absolutely. Well, a lot more conversations to have with uh, Hughes uh, Shanali in the coming days. But uh, thank you very much for the moment. Uh, other than a World News Special Correspondent, Susan Shanali, reporting from Toronto, Canada. Thank you. Well, let's get uh, more insights into this uh, um, subject. And of course, uh, we br um, bring on um, uh, Imran Furkan, other than a World News uh, International Affairs Analyst. Uh, he's back on the board uh, and uh, trying to figure out uh, what. I mean, let's be honest, Imran. It is Trump and Biden, isn't it? Yep, it's been four years. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is like a, a, a rework of uh, 2020, I think. Yeah, and, and, and it, it, like uh, today's result, and even though we've seen that uh, Nikki Haley saying that, no, no, she's going to go up until her home state, um, it doesn't look like that she has any path towards the nomination. No, no, she does not. And if you look at what happened today, um, I think uh, from the from the Republican one, it's very clear. You know, Trump won um, uh, with the double digit uh, percentage. Um, and also remember that this is a New Hampshire primary where the voters uh, can also be Democrats, right? So uh, for the Republican one, it's split between 50% registered Republicans and 50% what they call undeclared, which could be independent voters as well, right? Um, and so uh, therefore the win is quite 
quite, quite comprehensive. Um, and also, uh, it's not only among uh, Republicans. So I think the path forward for Nikki Haley really doesn't exist um, much. Um, and we also did have another one. Uh, everybody forgot about that one, which was the Democrat one. And obviously, Biden um, did not contest. Uh, these votes are right in votes because uh, there is a dispute between the Democratic National Committee and what's happening um, in in uh, in, um, in New Hampshire. Yes. But what's interesting is now we have. Uh, um, uh, RF, uh, I think um, uh, RFK, uh, is it RFJ? Yes, RF. RFK. Uh, uh, um, he's contesting as well. He initially said that he's uh, contesting from the Democratic Party, but it doesn't look like he's part of this entire primary process. Or? Yes, yes. I think he's uh, trying to go from one of the independent parties because he doesn't want to get knocked out at the early stage. <laughs> um, there but no he like is gaining traction. Uh, he, he is, but I think um, you need to also understand the process of why it's so early. Nobody's really paying attention. Um, and I think once it becomes just the Biden versus a Trump thing. I think both parties will call. So does state. this mean in the Democratic Party, I mean, of course, uh, today's primary was from the Republican Party, but if we are talking about this particular fact, uh, if you talk about the Democrat, uh, Democrats, does this mean there's not going to be a surprise candidate later on in in the race? Yeah, well, it very rarely happens. Right? If you have an incumbent president from either party, that person basically gets a pass in their own party's uh, primary. It's very difficult to run against an incumbent. right? It's almost impossible because you can't find funding. Uh, the incumbent has many powers as the existing president. Um, so nobody really thought that there was going to be a challenge. Um, the only possibility is if the, uh, if the president and the vice president or, you know, decide it's okay, I'm going to voluntarily not step in, and then either they'll have to reconfigure the whole Democratic uh, uh, or Republican Party pr pr process. My question is, of course, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of conversations within the Democratic Party to say Biden is really old now. If in case he gets another four-year term, it doesn't look like that he will have the mental equity uh, in order to uh, uh, finish his term or at least even, you know, go on. This election campaign would be really, uh, you know, bad on him in terms of health wise, uh, because with Trump, it's not going to be easy. You, you really have to be, uh, you know, formidable in that particular area. Do you think what you just said, you know, the incumbency holds a lot of uh, weight? But would that be thrown out because it seems like a special case scenario right now? Very interesting point. Uh, I don't know whether you watched the Nikki Haley speech. Um, I did. You know, uh, where he, she he said, even played it. Yeah. Exactly. Where she said, look, uh, you know, the first party that gets rid of the eight-year-old uh, will most probably win. Because Americans, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. Americans look forward. They don't look back. Um, but we have a choice of only two people who are eight years old who also contested four years ago. Uh, you know, they don't have that option. So if one of the bigger parties decides we're going to put a younger person in, then we're going to have a new face. And that person, you know, I think Americans could call around him. But I don't think that's going to really happen, to be honest with you, because now the, the, the primary process has started moving. They don't really have much time to have a proper process with the new candidates. So I think unless you know there is a medical emergency, uh, I think we're going to have a Biden versus Trump repeat. But in a case like that, I mean, I want to get into the Republican uh, primary and talk about the Republicans and uh, the possible VP uh, nod. Uh, but before that, uh, very quickly, in case let's say Joe Biden vacates, does it uh, mean that Kamala Harris is going to you know basically grab the nod, or would they look for someone else? Um, I think it depends on her because she's not very popular either, and uh, most polls show that she will. Electability is a question. Yes, against Trump in particular, right? Maybe with another candidate down the road, it's a separate issue. Um, what could happen is they may have to reconfigure their whole process and start again. I don't think Dean uh, Phillips is going to be your candidate, right? Um, so I think they will have to relook at the whole process. Uh, well, let's get back to the Republican primary and and what actually made Trump to stand. Uh, you know, basically tall in this entire race because none of the polls were predicting that he would lose or he had a chance to lose. Everybody all across the board since he announced said he's going to win. So what was the thing that he got right in terms of going and addressing the issues of uh, the voters? Interesting. So now it has changed, right? Um, four years ago, um, one of the main issues was abortion because he promised to put uh, justices in the Supreme Court. Um, which you know, he did. Uh, which he did, three of them, yeah. uh, who would uh, you know, vote against uh, abortion rights. 
um, and foreign policy was also an issue. Uh, migration, immigration, and economy was not as bad. Um, in 2020. In 2020. Now it has changed, right? If you look at this Fox News uh, vote analysis of, of New Hampshire uh, Republicans and what was important to them, immigration is the, by far the biggest issue because there are issues on the southern border with uh, lots of migrants coming in and, and you know states busing um, uh, migrants between each other. Um, and obviously, inflation is high. Um, you know, economy is also not uh, doing too well. Um, even though the numbers uh, show inflation is coming down and uh, jobs are strong, in terms of feeling it to the average American vote, I don't think that's happening now. So I think these two issues are big for Republicans. And, and, Trump, and I would say it is also for the Democrats, because now the Democrat-run cities where all these immigrants are coming and being dumped, those people are not happy either, and they are actually looking for alternatives. Yes uh, and no. So, for so example, um, for Democrats, abortion is a big issue um, because there are a lot of. Uh, it's because of the Roe versus Wade. Uh, yes, the, yes. So now uh, the, the the shift is towards, uh, and, and, and polls show that uh, the midterms in uh, you know 20, uh, 2018 and then uh, uh, the election of twenty twenty and the election midterms of twenty twenty two, abortion is one of the main reasons why Democrats scored wins that they were not supposed to get right. Um, so that is still remaining a big issue because there is no other alternative for them. Um, it's, a, it's a like gun rights is a big issue in America. Um, and for them, uh, foreign policy is also an issue in terms of the Middle East and, and Ukraine. Um, the immigration is, is an issue, but not as uh, to an extent as it yeah. is for Republicans. So I think, in general, immigration is a problem and uh, economy is a problem for, uh, for the general American public, but so is abortion. So if, I we, if, we, if we can go to the first slide uh, that we had uh, before. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, now here, if you, if you look at the numbers, uh, I think Donald Trump would, uh, uh, even though it says, well, once the uh, entire 99% uh, to 100% comes in, it'll look like uh, he will have around 11 delegates and Nikki Haley might have around uh, 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 eight, I think, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, somehow. And it yeah. might go to Ron DeSantis, one on, yeah. on so. But what I want to understand is it looks like, okay, so the next one is in Nevada. Um, then I think down the line in South yeah. Carolina. Uh, South, Carolina yes. so South Carolina is Nikki Haley's home state. Yes. Now, all the polls, Thus far, is showcasing that it's it's going to be Trump. So let's just hypothetically think it is the case. And in a situation like that, uh, we can't. I mean, 20, 20, uh, 2016 uh, election polls got it wrong. Yes, uh, completely. So we really can't, you know, uh, bank on them. But what I want to know is, in a case of Donald Trump, uh, you know, candidacy. Who's going to be the VP? Obviously not Mike Pence. Um, it's an interesting question. I think uh, Sosa say he has somebody in mind, but I don't think it's going to be either Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis because they're too high profile. Hmm. Trump does not want somebody overshadow, you know, overshadowing him, and that's why you got Mike Pence boring as yeah, boring yeah. can be. So it's going to be another boring person. Uh, it could be possibly a, 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 a female, and a possibly, you know, um, I think it'll be exciting if it's an African American uh, Republican female, but I, I'd say it'll be a, a younger uh, female, possibly. Um, Vivek Ramaswamy? Um, again, too high profile. Today, when you saw him, uh, you know, allowing him to speak, he said, you know, I bring Vivek one minute. So that's a classic, classic sign that he doesn't want him overshadowing him as well. The problem with Trump is he doesn't want anybody else overshadowing him. And honestly, in the long term, VP picks don't make a big difference. People don't vote for no, but, VP picks. But last uh, election in 2016, it mattered because uh, Mike Pence, uh, despite the fact that uh, you know he was boring and he was not not charismatic as Donald Trump, uh, he brought in the evangelical vote, and the evangelicals were very uh, you know crucial to win uh, to that victory of Donald Trump in 2016. Now, he might be looking at these demographies in order to make sure that he can bring the vote back and ha can have a commanding position when facing uh, uh, Joe Biden. In a situation like that, who seems to be like in the best position to be his VP not? Um, well, it's changed, right? Um, if you look at what happened in Iowa and New Hampshire, you'll see that the evangelicals went uh, in a large way with Trump this time, much more than they did in 2016 yeah. or 2020, right? Um, because he, he has delivered for them. So I think this time around, uh, I think he will look at a couple of areas which are, 
you know, uh, which are um, uh, troublesome for him. Now, if you notice, he, there's a nuanced view of his abortion. Um, it has changed now a little bit because he recognizes it as, as an issue that he needs to sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, address. So it might be someone who's a little bit more moderate on that. Um, it might be somebody else who's also look at uh, foreign policy experience, which where he was considered a little, you know, weak in. So the economy, I think voters trust him. And also, uh, voters trust him with uh, immigration. I think he needs to get a, a VP choice who addresses abortion and who addresses foreign policy. I think if he can get someone with a little bit of experience, uh, so ideally, Nikki Haley might be a good one, but she's too high profile for him. Uh, I mean, Nikki Haley. I mean, <laughs> even though I don't, I mean, there is no evidence to say this, but it looks like she is a, democ a democratic, pl a democrat plant uh, per se, because uh, you know a lot of Democrats were in that number of 130,029 possibly. Uh, uh, possibly that's that's what a lot of uh, you know analysts in america is saying imran Furkan, uh, we ha have to leave it at that thank you very much really appreciate it obviously there's going to be a lot of conversations of on this as as it moves on but it might not be as interesting as this because it looks like this is it's a trump uh, this is biden yes yeah exactly <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Oscars are upon us, but there's quite an interesting story when the uh, nomination came out uh, yesterday. Ryan Gosling has uh, spoken out about his disappointment that Barbie director Greta Gerwig and star Margot Robbie were not nominated in two major Oscar categories despite receiving a nod himself. The actor who was nominated for his uh, supporting role as Ken in the uh, box office juggernaut described it as an understatement to say and he was very disappointed. Meanwhile, Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer led the nomination list with 30 nods. The world will remember this day. He is the genius behind some of the biggest blockbusters in modern cinema. Could this be the film that finally wins Christopher Nolan an Oscar? And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. His painstaking attention to detail, including recreating the first nuclear weapon detonation without CGI effects, in part why it leads this year's Oscar nominations. And while Irish actor Killian Murphy, an eerily close lookalike for the man the story was based on, has to be a front runner for best actor. My two unlikely companions. If anyone was going to cause an upset, it's this man, Paul Giamatti, a hugely talented character actor who you'd assume had already won one. I can tell by your faces that many of you are shocked at the outcome. Nominated for his role as a teacher in The Holdovers, typically understated. I'm really happy because I think it's a great movie and I think everybody's great in it and that, that, that's, that's good. And if other stuff happens, sure, that's fine. Perhaps the underdog to watch out for, The Zone of Interest, a film about a family living outside of Auschwitz, picking up nominations in some of the biggest categories, including Best Picture and Director. I'm just as for Barbie, there is a certain irony to a man picking up so much recognition for the feminist reimagining of the doll's backstory. Ryan Gosling up for Best Supporting Actor as well as for his song. Pumped full of Kennedy, could he win his first ever Oscar? We'll find out on March the 10th. See you on the Malibu Beach! Come on, let's be honest. Barbie was a horrible movie. I don't know, like halfway through it, I was like questioning myself, why am I wasting my time watching this? Yeah. Uh, anyway, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for joining. We'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with another edition of World News. See you then. Bye for now.